I don't know if you have noticed it, <clears throat> but um, we are not doing announcements in the services, okay? That doesn't mean that we don't like announcements. That just means <laughs> that we're trying to keep the focus where it belongs on Jesus during our worship service. Now, we want to keep you informed. So there are many, many ways that you can do that. We want you to go to the website, if that is your technology uh, level of achievement, do that. That's a great way to do it. Um, there uh, will also be an email coming out, probably not this week, but perhaps next week, with all the announcements on Monday morning. So that'll just automatically come to your inbox. And then also, if you are really addicted <laughs> to the old style announcements, here is a printout of what we have. Most of them are in your bulletin, but some of them are not, and they are out in the uh, uh, coffee area, so you can, uh, can get those there. So we're just trying to keep that focus driving it forward on Jesus. Well, if you are as old as I am, which is getting closer to the age of dirt, um, you re may remember the movie called The Ten Commandments. I won't ask for a show of hands. Starring? Okay, Charlton Heston. Very good. Each year it was broadcast during the Easter season, and I bet you could find it still today. One of my most vivid memories from this movie, apart from the parting of the Dead Sea, is how Cecil B. DeMille portrayed the burning bush. In Exodus 3, the Bible tells us that God appeared to Moses in a bush that was on fire, but the bush didn't burn up. From this bush, God told Moses to deliver his people from slavery in Egypt to the freedom of the promised land. Well, I'm going to give you a new word today that you can use this week to help you sound really smart. Numinosity, it's a new word for me as well. It means suggesting the presence of the divine. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can walk up to anybody and say, I'm numinous, are you? And they'll say, put a mask on. I don't know what they'll say. <laughs> Just like that burning bush, followers of Jesus, we're numinous. We have the presence of God in us, yet like that bush, we're not burned up. Remember that. We're coming back to it in a moment. Today, as we celebrate uh, the, the gospel, we celebrate our new spirit. When we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in us, freeing us from the flesh, freeing us to serve and ready for God to produce fruit in us. Would you pray with me? Father, as we open your word today, I pray that each of us would allow your spirit that is in us to remind us who we are so that we can live in the way that you want us to live. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you do not have a Bible and would like one, raise your hand. Our ushers will give one to you. If you don't have a Bible at home, please take this one with you. It is our gift to you. But before we get into the text for today, I want to once again look at what we've come through in this sermon series so far. God designed the human person to have three parts. The body is, of course, the part that we see that is visible. It is temporary. The soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. This is our personality. It will exist forever. The third part is our spirit. This is the part of us that connects us to God and helps us communicate with him. Now, Adam and Eve, they were created with an alive spirit. They were perfectly connected to God. 
But they chose to disobey God and sin. Their spirits died. And connection to God was cut off. And this wonderful nature is what has been passed down from generation to generation, all the way to us lucky (laughs) recipients of this old, dead, sinful nature. But God. The Bible tells us that though through the disobedience of Adam and Eve, we all received dead hearts. But through the obedience of through the obedience of Jesus, it's a Sunday school answer, it's okay. Through the obedience of Jesus, the possibility of having our hearts restored was brought about. How? By Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, his burial, and his Ooh, this is the good news of the gospel. You see, when we place our faith in Jesus for salvation, we die to sin, and we are resurrected to new life with him. We receive these brand new, shiny, gold, righteous hearts. Fulfills that prophecy from centuries before Jesus was born. Ezekiel said, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. So, this new spirit is what we're going to focus on today. So let's take a look at our text. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Skip down to verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Later in our, when we finish our text, we'll see about keeping in step with the Spirit and living in the Spirit. These are all callings that are placed upon the follower of Jesus. Last week, we talked about our spiritual location. We said that after we put our trust In Jesus, our spiritual location shifts from being in Adam to being in Christ. The Bible tells us that when we are in Christ, that God's spirit lives in us. Do you not know, Paul says in Corinthians, that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Don't let that flow by. That's important stuff. With that indwelling of the Spirit, Paul reminds us that we are called to freedom. And the first thing that he wants us to be aware of 
is that we are free from the flesh. Remember these two things that are still around to bug us even when we are followers of Jesus and have placed our trust in him? Sin and the flesh. We still have the choice to choose sin or to choose to live by the flesh. But here Paul is reminding us that we are free from the flesh because we have died to the flesh. So that means we are free to choose not to do the works of the flesh. Paul gives us a list of these fleshly works, and unfortunately I have to read them again. (sighs) Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. Wow, isn't that a fun bunch to talk about? When we are in Christ, these temptations don't go away. The flesh is still available to us as a choice. But when we are in Christ, we can choose to be free from the flesh because of his power. When we are walking by the Spirit, The Holy Spirit is constantly reminding us. The Holy Spirit is constantly inspiring us that because we have these new hearts, our new identity makes us better than stooping to this list. The Spirit reminds us that sin is beneath us. We are blameless, we are awesome, we are holy and righteous. Why would we want to do these things when the Spirit has made us new and complete? And we know another thing, that when we give in to these things, with our new heart, we're only going to be miserable. So let's take a look at this list First, is the list complete? Is every sin on this list? No. He says it here. And things like these. Paul Paul is giving us some examples of the works of the flesh. If yours isn't up there, you you didn't luck out. (laughs) The other thing to notice about this list is the type of of sins that are on here. There's a whole bunch of different types of sins. I bet in less than two minutes, if I let you work among yourselves, you could rank these sins as which ones are worse and which ones are better, not as bad. Don't we often rate sexual sins as the really bad ones? Certainly, jealousy is not as bad as participating in an orgy But what does the Bible say? The Bible says if we commit one sin, we're guilty of all of it. There's no hierarchy. Sin is sin is sin. When we are walking by the Spirit and realizing who God has made us to be, those shiny new hearts that he has placed in In us, we have the freedom to make the choice to not participate in any of these activities. Now, let's take a look at freedom from the flesh from a different perspective. Some churches, not this one, but some churches attempt to dictate walking by the Spirit. And how do they do it? They issue rules and regulations. Don't go to the movies. Don't wear this type of clothing. Don't let your hair get too long if you're a man or too short if you're a woman. This is legalism. This is not the freedom that Paul is talking about. The Bible says, for the Lord is the Spirit 
And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You see, walking by the Spirit brings liberty to make choices. Now, we know we will feel bad and have consequences if we choose incorrectly, but if you're waiting for me to dictate what's right and what's wrong from up here, it's not going to happen. When we choose correctly, it is a result of God's freeing spirit within us. The spirit is our great reminder. He reminds us that we are new. He reminds us that we are dead to sin. <clears throat> he reminds us that we are free to do anything we'd like to do. But he also reminds us, as Paul says in Corinthians, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Other translations say everything is permitted, but everything is not beneficial. Or as the NLT puts it, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. So let's take this idea of movies. We can go to the movies. We're allowed. Some of them actually encourage us to walk by the Spirit. But as you well know, not all movies are beneficial because they keep us in the flesh. If we allow the flesh to influence us, what's going to happen? We're going to continue to express the flesh. These movies may actually inspire increased impurity, increased quarreling, envy. Is that what we want? But when we walk with the Spirit, we ask, will this movie be helpful to me? Will this movie be beneficial to me? This is a lifelong process. We need to reason and grow in what it means to walk by the Spirit. It takes a lifetime to determine what is profitable, to determine what is good for us. We have to learn. We have to learn that some choices, while we're free to do it, will fail us. As we move on through verse 13, Paul gives us a more positive way to use our freedom. He says, for you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We are to use our freedom for loving service. Free to serve. Seems like a little bit of an oxymoron to me, does it to you? You know, like organized chaos, deafening silence, or awfully good, free to serve? If I have a free day, the last thing I want to do is serve someone else. If I have a free day, I'm going to serve myself with a few hours in the recliner, some chip and dip and some binge watching of HGTV. Oops, uh, did I just admit uh, to using my freedom as an opportunity to indulge the flesh? I think I did. But do you ever find yourself moving down that road too? What does Paul mean? By using our freedom to serve others in love. I have a little confession to make. I did hear a few things that went on here while I was gone for my sabbatical. I smiled at most of them, but one of them got me really riled up, and I was ready to come in with both guns blazing. Robin Walker, our children's ministry director, couldn't find a teacher for our discovery land. Well, I was, I, I was going to come and I was going to lay a guilt trip on everybody and I said, 
come on, what's going on here? Now that would have probably refute, uh, recruited a few guilty volunteers. It would not have been in line with what Paul is teaching on serving in love. Paul did not say, serve others out of guilt. Paul did not say, serve others to earn God's approval. Paul doesn't even say, well, you better do it because if you don't, nobody else will. The Bible just says, use your freedom to serve others in love. You probably know I love the definition of love that goes like this. Love is acting in the best interest of the other person because that's what Jesus did for us. He acted in our best interest, even though it cost him his life. So we are to use our freedom to serve the best interest of others. If we view service to the Lord as a requirement, as a duty, or something to be done out of guilt, it's not done with freedom. We're doing it to fulfill laws. We're doing it to fulfill obligations. Maybe we do it because the enemy is saying, you better do it or else God is going to get you. Or we might do it because you better serve or God is going to take away your ticket to heaven. They're wrong motivations for serving. If anybody's ever laid that on you, give it back. It's the quickest way to experience burnout, stress, irritation, and exhaustion. How do we tote the line between loving service and bitter, guilt-ridden duty? Well, Nancy and I didn't know back some 30-plus years ago now if we would be blessed with children of our own. But we were sure thrilled when the test came back saying pregnant. For nine months, we were giddy with glee. Well, maybe I was. I don't know if Nancy was all the time, especially in the morning. But then we brought Betsy home. After a week had gone by, I remember very specifically, I was mowing the lawn, and I was not happy. I said to myself, almost sobbing, my life is over. For the next 18 years, I will never be free to do what I want to do ever again. I will never again be able to take a nap on Sunday afternoon or do anything fun. The next time I changed a diaper, it was not done out of loving service. Don't we all want to serve our families in love? But don't we all struggle with thoughts that reek of bitterness and discontentment? I know I'm not alone in this. We've all been there. In the church, people jump up with willing hearts because it's the right thing to do. And then continue to serve because of guilt leads many to become bitter. And they actually end up being the biggest critics of how everything is done. In the workplace, eager new employees take a new job after burning out of their old one. They eagerly join a new team and jump in with full steam for fleshly reasons only a year later to find themselves unhappy at work yet again. You see, service without love at the center leads to bad outcomes. So how do we accomplish this impossible task of letting love drive our service? I'm not giving it to you. You're going to have to look it up this afternoon. 1 John 4, 
10 through 14. You look it up. First, not now, this afternoon. First John 4, 10, 14. This says, basically, we only love and serve because God has so graciously loved and served us first. How do we love and serve in freedom? We don't do it under our strength. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And where is that spirit? It's inside of us. It's inside of us. Just like we make the choice not to give into the flesh, not to sin because of those new hearts that we have been given, we choose to serve because of this new heart. Just like sin is incompatible with this bright, shiny, new heart. So self-focus, self-service, and selfishness, they're incompatible with this new heart. Yeah, we're free. We are absolutely free to sit in our recliners. But does that activity reflect the new heart that we've been given? We're free to focus on what gives us pleasure. But does this go along with the spirit that lives in us? Now, I want to interrupt your thoughts right now. First of all, some of us are tired and we do need to rest, okay? I'm not speaking against that. And I'm also not speaking against, I'm not speaking to you with condemnation. If you feel condemned by the words that I am speaking, it is not coming from me, it is not coming from the Spirit, it is coming from the enemy. There is no condemnation from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not get into that kind of thing. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit affirms us. The Holy Spirit calls us to loving service that is empowered by him. The Holy Spirit is saying to us, well, yeah, Dave, sure, you can enjoy your bonbons in bed, but you are made for so much more. I want what is best for you, the Holy Spirit says. We find what is best for us in loving service in the Bible. The Bible says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You noticing a little theme this morning, this theme of walking? Now, Unfortunately, it's not, it's not true for everyone, but for most people, walking is pretty easy. We do it without thinking. Now, jogging, biking, swimming, that's a different story for me anyway. But walking, when we have the ability, it's as easy as falling off a log. That's how we've got to look at these good works. That's how we should look at these loving acts of service. God has prepared these for us from the beginning of time. And if we're doing them from our new spirit, the Holy Spirit just inspires us to walk right through them. I like to translate this as just walk into them. It's kind of like a bowling ball. When it hits the pin, what happens? It falls over. When we encounter a good work that God has called us to do, it's easy. What did Jesus say? My yoke is heavy. My burden should make you dread getting up in the morning. Did Jesus say that? No, Jesus said my yoke is easy. My burden is light. This is what loving service is. This only happens when we walk by the Spirit, when we realize that it's the power of the Holy Spirit in us and not our strength. Finally, 
When we are walking by the Spirit, the Spirit produces fruit. So let's look at the fruit list one more time. You know this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Who doesn't want some of that? But there were two errors in the statement that I just said. The first one was work. Do we work at producing this fruit? And if we find a deficiency in ourselves, do we work on producing more of that particular fruit? You can go online, I don't recommend it, but you can say, uh, fruit of the Spirit test. And they'll have some free ones there for you. Don't do it! We certainly need to cooperate with the Spirit in allowing fruit to be produced in our lives, but this is not something that we work at. Paul starts out this portion of Scripture by saying clearly, this fruit comes from the Spirit. Some translations say, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit with our new righteous heart. It is guaranteed that fruit is going to be produced. The second error was that it is fruit, not fruits. It's singular, not plural. There's a tendency to separate these and assess ourselves on which individual fruits are being produced in our lives and which one needs work. Who is producing the fruit? The Spirit. God is producing the fruit. Then who should be in charge of giving us the fruit that we need for a certain time? God should be in charge of that. What if we're praying for patience and the Lord feels it's time for us to stop sitting around and step up and do something? Maybe instead of patience we've been praying for, Jesus knows we need to deal with this difficult situation right now. And the time for patience is over. We've got to stop individualizing the fruits and trust the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We must remember another thing. That the Holy Spirit gives us this fruit and it's produced from us to show off Jesus, not to show off us. It's to show off the new heart that we have been given. It's to show off the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. We think that the fruit of the Spirit is kind of like a behavior modification program. It's not. The fruit is not given so that we look better, so that we behave better. It's given so that God's presence will radiate in us. Which brings me back to that word, numinosity, and God's presence in the burning bush. Before placing our trust in Jesus, We are this dead bush. We are not numinous. But God replaces our dead heart and gives us his spirit. This bush that is us is set on fire. But just like in Moses' case, the bush is not consumed. In fact, because it is numinous, because God is present, The bush comes to life. Buds appear as we realize our identity in Christ. 
Soon the foliage of, of God's presence is seen as the, as the pr- bush starts to produce fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But did you notice something? The bush is still there. It is not consumed. Some of the impurities are, yes, burned away. But the Spirit shines through each of us in our personalities that God has designed, and they are unique. All this comes from the work of Jesus to give us freedom free from the flesh, free to do deeds of loving service that he has prepared for us to do and free to enjoy and live in the fruit that the Spirit produces. That is not legalism. That's not following rules to get to this point. That's grace. That's God's goodness lavished upon us. It's unearned. It's undeserved. How does this happen? Well, it happens just like we've been learning about for the last four weeks. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that should get us celebrating, should it not? Celebrating what is available to us. Would you pray with me?